Hello, my name is Patrick Murphy, and I am the student body president at Marshall University. And it is my distinct privilege to welcome you to the 40th annual memorial service for the 1970 Marshall University football team, the coaches, supporters, and flight crew. Please stand for the presentation of our colors by the Marshall University ROTC. Thank you, please be seated. Alan Meadows, our invocation speaker, was an original member of the Young Thundering Herd. He was a great player from Scott High School in Madison, West Virginia, as one of the first players signed by Jack Langle and his coaching staff. He was a defensive lineman and team leader for Marshall from 1971 to 1974. Please help me welcome Mr. Alan Meadows. Thank you. November 14th, 1970, to live on in the lives of all of us and those that go beyond us. Everyone that was alive then knows where they were, what they were doing, and can recall some of the activities they were involved in immediately after. And as we remember that, Let's remember the family, the friends, the students, and all the people that are involved in this and continue to remember forever. If you feel comfortable at this time, would you take the hand of the person next to you and join me in prayer? Almighty God, we thank you for this time to remember. We thank you that Marshall University has never forgotten the fallen and that each year we gather at this time to honor and remember the 75 lives lost so suddenly and tragically. Watch over each family member gathered here today and the generations born after their loved ones departed without getting to know him, them. We know we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses this day and they are looking down on us today knowing that they always will be remembered as brave and true sons of Marshall. Like Nehemiah building the wall, these men and women are the foundation that has rebuilt the football program here at Marshall University. God, watch over the family members, loved ones, and friends of these sons of Marshall, and may we never, never, never forget the sacrifice made on this day 40 years ago. His holy name we pray. Amen. On behalf of the Marshall University student body, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to the 40th annual memorial service for the 1970 Marshall University plane crash. Significant anniversary milestones call attention to important events. However, the need to remember those who lost their life contributing to the growth and success of Marshall University is as true today as it was 40 years ago. There's no different, this year is no different than any other year. Today we'll hear from numerous individuals, all with different Marshall experiences and insight into the events of November 14, 1970. However, one common thread connecting everyone is their love and passion for the Marshall community. We'll hear from our head football coach and Hurricane West Virginia native, John Doc Holliday, Marshall graduate and director of athletics, Mike Hamrick, 
our university president, Dr. Stephen J. Cobb, and West Virginia Senate President and Governor-designate Earl Ray Tomlin. To conclude, we'll have the ceremonial laying of the wreath and the silencing of the memorial fountain. At this time, I would like to introduce Sarah Schofield, who will offer her own tribute with a rendition of Amazing Grace. Sarah graduated from Marshall with a Bachelor's of Science in Biology in 2005 and then a Master's in Biological Sciences in 2007. Sarah. Coach Holiday is a Hurricane West Virginia native. He is widely regarded as one of the top recruiters in the nation, and he brings with him 31 years of collegiate coaching experience to Marshall that includes stops at Florida, North Carolina State, and West Virginia. We are proud to have him here as our coach, John Doc Holiday. Thank you very much. November 14, 1970, I was in eighth grade at Hurricane Junior High School uh, when the crash happened. I felt your pain. I asked the same questions we all ask as to why. I saw Coach Lingle and I saw the community bound together and bring the football program back. And I saw the struggles that got to, to getting back to winning championships. There are bigger football programs in America than Marshall University, but there's not a football program in America that's more important to their school, more important to their community, more important to their fan base, in the entire country than Marshall University. As your head football coach, I wake up every morning with a responsibility to get this football program back to winning championships. Your staff understands that, I understand that, and that's exactly what's gonna happen. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Mike Hamrick, played football at Marshall University from 1976 to 1980, starting at linebacker and a defensive end his last two years. After receiving his bachelor's degree in education from Marshall, he earned his ma master's in sports administration from Ohio University in 1981. Prior to being named the director of athletics in July of, nine, of 2009, Mr. Hamrick was a director of athletics at the University of ne Nevada, Las Vegas for six years. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Mike Hamrick. Good afternoon. A year ago, I was given the opportunity to address this group at this event, and I can tell you it was the most exhilarating and inspiring day of my life. I left Marshall University in 1980 with a great college degree 
with a great athletic experience and an opportunity to move on in life and do something that I really love to do, and that's work in college athletics. I would have never had that opportunity if it hadn't been for this great university, and I'd never had the opportunity to be in college athletics if it hadn't been for those 75 people that we lost November 14th, 1970. I can assure you, as long as I'm the director of athletics at Marshall University, we will never forget and we will always honor those people that sacrifice the ultimate for us. There's many things that I'm looking forward to in my life but one thing I really look forward to is one day I will meet those 75 people. And I hope they will say to me, Mike, I'm proud of what you did and what you people did for Marshall University. You know, I never, I never met Teddy or Art, Marcello, Dennis, Joe. Never met Mr. Kautz. Never met Coach Tolley. Never met... Gene Morehouse, but you know what? Since the day I arrived on this campus, I felt like I've known him for my entire life. And I think everyone in this community feels like we have known them. I hope Mr. Couch, the athletic director's looking up there saying, son, you're doing a fine job. I hope Coach Tolley's looking down saying, Doc, go recruit some players. You've won three in a row. Let's, let's make these guys up here proud of you. Can't wait to meet those guys and talk about the days of being a Marshall University football player. And I hope those guys are proud of what's happening at this university. I'm honored, I'm humbled to be here today as your director of athletics and speak at this wonderful event. I can only imagine looking here at the family members, your anticipation of one day joining me and all the former Thundering Herd football players and all the coaches and all the supporters one day meeting those 75 people who gave the ultimate for this university and telling them how much we love them and how much we appreciate them. Go Herd and thank you so much for being here today. It is a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Marshall University President, Dr. Stephen J. Kopp. Dr. Kopp became president of Marshall University on July 1st, 2005. He has a wide range of academic experience within higher education, and as president of Marshall University, has overseen a period of Marshall's history marked by tremendous growth and development. Dr. Stephen J. Kopp. I'd like to offer my thanks to each and every one of you who have assembled here today. This is truly a day of remembering. Remembering those who perished, as well as remembering and honoring those who survived. We have many family members here today, descendants, relatives, dear friends of the people who've perished, and to you, we welcome you back to Marshall University, and for some, we welcome you to Marshall University for the first time. We also have people assembled here today who come from all over the country, never before having direct ties to Marshall University except learning about this great tragedy at some point in their lives. And they felt compelled enough to make the pilgrimage here to Marshall University to join us today to honor the 75 people who perished in the plane crash. And to you, we say thank you for joining with us today to celebrate their lives, commemorate them, and show the respect, the enduring respect, we have for their great sacrifice. In remembering, we honor the memory of those who lost their lives and confer upon them our utmost respect. 
In remembering, we find comfort and peace. Anyone who has ever lost a loved one has experienced the wound that opens and forever imparts an emptiness in our hearts and spirits, a void which is never really refilled. In remembering, we are reminded of the power of love, family, and community. In remembering, we mend the shattered fragments of our lives and rejoice in the resiliency of the human spirit and our determination to triumph over adversity and tragedy. In remembering, we are reminded how precious life is, how precious our time on this earth truly is, and we recognize with greater clarity and appreciation the blessings each brings. In remembering, we affirm the meaning of our lives and discover the courage to go on, to renew and rededicate ourselves to making our time on this earth matter. One of the letters we received this week, and each year we receive many letters, came from a couple in Massachusetts who has no ties to Marshall University whatsoever. But over time, have developed a bond with this university that connects us across time and space. He writes, I am 56 years old and was 16 years old when this awful tragedy occurred, then a sophomore at Wakefield High School in Wakefield, Massachusetts. Back then, I couldn't fully grasp the magnitude of grief that this incident caused the city of Huntington and Marshall University. On this 40th anniversary of this tragic plane crash, please count my wife and me as among those who want to honor those 75 victims. Albeit belated, the families, the friends, and the whole city and university have our deepest and serious, sincerest condolences. The fact that the university and community continue to honor those victims says so very much about the people of the Marshall University community and the people of West Virginia. So finally, in remembering these precious souls, we affirm their memory and our solemn promise to never, ever forget. May God bless all who are assembled here today. Thank you. Our next speaker is the president of the West Virginia Senate and will become the 35th governor of West Virginia after current Governor Joe Manchin is sworn in as a United States Senator. He too is an alumnus of Marshall receiving a master's in business, business administration. Please help me in welcoming Senate President and Governor-designate Earl Ray Tomlin. Good afternoon. President Kopp, members of the Thundering Herb football team, coaches and staff, those here today who experienced the events of November 14th, 1970, and have survived to carry on the legacy of those we lost, and to all the sons and daughters of John Marshall gathered here today. I am honored to have been asked to take part in today's observance of an event that took place when I was a freshman in college. And as I embark on a new and historic role in state government, I have taken time to reflect on my life and the events which have shaped it. The loss sustained 40 years ago is one of those moments that I will always carry with me wherever I go and whatever I do. It is almost unbelievable that nearly two generations have passed to bring us to this special commemoration of a dark day in our states and in our own personal histories. It is a day remembered in tears and emotion and a day of special pilgrimage which will continue each fall and spring for as long as this institution stands. Since it has been four decades when the lives of thousands in Huntington, in West Virginia, and even across the nation were shattered, 
I am moved by the sheer and quick passage of time since it happened. For those who lived during those times, as I did, it truly seems like it happened almost yesterday. Yet emotionally, it is, it is an eternity of enduring loss. I am stricken as well with the knowledge that as time passes, fewer will remain to be here on this day who can remember what it was like to, to have experienced that sad news. That is why this memorial service and this fountain will become even more important to Marshall and to those who attend this institution of higher learning and compete in its fields and courts. It will represent forever not only the heart, but the heartbeat of the university. Some will come here and not know of the events of four decades ago and will ask, what does this mean? What does it represent? And as they view this fountain, they will learn that it enshrines not only precious memories of great individuals, of heroism and loyalty, but the hopes and aspirations of generations of those who have and will venerate the greatness of Marshall University and its hallowed past. So it serves us today, as it will for those yet to come, even maybe for centuries, a lasting memorial, not just of tragedy, but as a trophy and symbol of great challenges, and a trophy to the overcoming spirit, spirit of champions. From ashes to glory, let's always remember, we are Marshall. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce this year's keynote speaker, William Mickey Jackson. Mr. Jackson is a president of the Marshall University Alumni Association. He is a 1968 Marshall graduate and played football for the Thundering Herd from 1964 through 1966. He gained 1,231 yards rushing for his career and scored 24 touchdowns. He was an assistant coach for the 1970 football team and continued as an assistant coach until 1973. He lives in Columbus, Ohio, and formerly was backfield coach for legendary coach Woody Hayes at Ohio State University. Please help me in welcoming our keynote speaker, William Mickey Jackson. Thank you very much, Patrick. You read it just as I wrote it. Good afternoon. What a, what a wonderful, beautiful audience today from our current president, Dr. Stephen Kopp, to my first hello when I stepped on campus um, back in August of 1963. There's been so many people that have been a part of my life that I refer to now as my Marshall University family. I am very pleased to greet my Marshall family this afternoon. I'm grateful and humbled to be here to honor the 75 victims of the 1970 Marshall University plane crash. As president of the Marshall University Alumni Association, I represent thousands of Marshall alums and friends around the world who honor those men and women who lost their lives and made a mark in the hearts of a school, a community, and a nation. Forty years ago on a rainy hillside in Wayne County, where the lives of 75 people were lost in the worst single air tragedy in NCAA sports history. I was in a car on the Pennsylvania Turnpike with Coach Carl Coker, and the two of us had taken the scouting assignment to get notes and gather information on Ohio University. They were playing at Penn State 
So we drove into State College on Friday evening after practice and scouted a game, took very good notes, and shortly after the game, uh, we did learn that we had lost a close one at East Carolina. We're a little disappointed by that news, but we're confident that we had taken enough notes to assure a victory against Ohio University in our last game of the season. So as we were in the car searching radio stations just to get some other scores across the nation, college football, we heard that there was a plane down in Huntington, West Virginia. Just not really believing what we heard, we had to kind of search another station and two or three times we, we heard there's a plane down in Huntington, West Virginia. It may have lost the entire football team. Well, surely then it, we needed to confirm some type of confirmation. And uh, without the use of a cell phone at that time, we had to pull over into the roadside gas station and use the land telephone line, call back to Huntington. The circuits are all tied up. They're all busy. We can't get through. We sit there. We get back in the car. We drive some more. We call again. And finally, the State Highway Patrol phone number did confirm our, our, worst, our worst story that we had lost our entire football team and coaching staff and fans that were aboard the plane. I remember our next stop being about 5 a.m. in the morning, and we went directly to the uh, football office to join Gail Parker and Coach Red Dawson. And I can't say enough for the leadership that Coach Red Dawson provided to us during that time. As we sat there, and it was virtually our home for the next four months, trying to bring a sense of order to a very complicated environment in a university, in a community that was filled full of grief and was in mourning. As we look today at this 6,500 pound memorial fountain that was created in 1972 by a great artist by the name of Harry Batoa. He dedicated this to the memory of the 75 people to commemorate the living, not rather than the dead. He wanted this fountain to um, display the waters of life rising, receding, surging to express upward growth, immortality, and eternality. There are 75 strands of steel forged to look like a gigantic flower. And at the base of that gigantic flower is this eloquent inscription that says, they shall live on in the hearts and the families and their friends forever. And this memorial records their loss to the university and to the community. This inscription has run true to course for 40 years now because they do, they certainly do live on in our hearts, in the hearts of their families and friends. And it is our individual responsibility today to make sure that we never ever forget that this structure and annual ceremony, which is just a small token a representation of the loss that we've had at Marshall University, a loss to Huntington, West Virginia, and a loss to the United States of America and the world. Last year at the conclusion of this ceremony, um, when they come out and place the reef at the fountain base, and when I heard the last Pardon me. When I heard that last drop of water finally stop, I 
I suddenly felt a, a rush of emotion. And it felt as if my heart is actually stopped at the same time. Well, I r realized that it didn't because I suddenly remembered my guys and, and Jack Repassi and Dennis Blevins, Joe Hood, Art Harris, Teddy Shoebridge. I remembered Charlie Couts on the, on the plane. He was the uh, athletic director. I remember him as my f head freshman football coach who really taught me how to be a student athlete. He taught me how to win at a higher level. And he protected me from those huge varsity football players. <laughs> you know, our primary job as freshman football players at that time, we were not eligible to play varsity, but our, our primary job was to get the varsity ready to compete week in and week out. And we took pride in trying to show them that we could, we could, uh, we were good athletes, and they didn't make a mistake by offering us a scholarship as a freshman. I remember the first time that I ran this uh, pitch play. It was called a pitch 18. We had run it a hundred times in high school because I had come from a high school that was undefeated in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, and we won all of our games, and we just scored at will and. Pitch 18 was one of my favorite plays. Well, when I saw that play on the board and we had a chance as a freshman team to run it against the number one defense, I smiled. Pitched that ball to me and I started around the right end. As I got to the outside leg of the right tackle, I sort of dipped my inside shoulder just to kind of freeze the defense to determine whether they were outside me or inside. And what that does is it makes them hesitate if for a moment, and that's all you need to, in an advantage, just that little advantage. And uh, I scooted around the right end and scampered into the end zone for a touchdown, and our whole team was cheering except for the defensive unit and Coach Snyder. <laughs> I thought I did good, but Coach says, line them up and run that play again. So we lined up and we ran the play again and uh, I took the pitch and I got to the outside leg of the right tackle, I dipped my inside shoulder and when I, when I, when I finally woke up on the sideline, <laughs> the trainer had two fingers up in my face and he says, how many fingers? And I thought it was a trick question. <laughs> Coach Couch, uh, in the future, every time I scampered around the end and ran a long touchdown against a varsity, he would always tell the coach I was tired and he'd put somebody else in. So he really protected me. And I certainly uh, miss Coach Couch, I miss Lucy. And uh, when I see his wife, Lucy, and the three beautiful daughters, I uh, saw Lucy Ann and Lee yesterday. They always greet me with a big hug, and uh, they're, they're, they're family, they're family. I suddenly also remembered uh, Ray and Shirley Hagley. On the plane, he was our team physician. Off the field, they were great friends. Remember, he, he found out that after I graduated from college and I went out to live in a community and to rent a house, uh, he found out when I was denied housing due to the color of my skin, he went out and bought a house and rented it back to me. It was his way of saying, we're in this thing together and we're going to move on from here. He and Shirley will certainly be missed. 
I remember Coach Rick Tolley, who gave me my opportunity to coach at the college level. He was a taskmaster, certainly who knew how to prepare and lead young men to greatness. And I learned a lot from him. Without that opportunity, I would have never missed the great experiences I had coaching some of the best running backs in the country. I would have missed working with and learning from the great head football coaches that I worked with, such as Jack Lingle, Dick Crum, and Woody Hayes. Yes, it was, it was very difficult, as you can see now. It was difficult for me to keep the tears from flowing. But then there was this inspirational thought that told me how fortunate I was to have experienced those relationships and to be a part of the movement to cherish and honor those times, to help tell the story of Marshall University and have them live on in the heart, in my heart forever. You know, this story had been very private and close to our hearts in the community for over 30 years until Warner Brothers came knocking and they continued to knock until they, they finally convinced members of the university and the community that they would treat the story with honor and dignity. So now the story is public and shared by millions and this is a very motivational story. You know how many times I've been asked to speak about We Are Marshall. I heard yesterday that a lady flew in from California that rented a car and went up to Spring Hill Cemetery and was at the game and is here today to um, share that experience. And just because she saw the movie, I say to the families and friends of those who we are honoring here today, welcome home and, and come back often. We're just across the street, actually, in our beautiful new home called the Marshall University Foundation Hall and Erickson Alumni Center. Join us and be connected, be engaged, and be involved, because you do make Marshall University stronger. You know that we are all connected for life because of this memorial event, and it is our responsibility to continue this commitment to deliver that promise that is on the base of that fountain there, to never forget and let those uh, folks live on in our hearts forever. Because I, I, I am Marshall, and I see that you, you are Marshall, and collectively, we are Marshall. Thank you. We will now have the ceremonial laying of the wreath by representatives of the Serrato Fire Department and by head football coach Doc Holliday, followed by the silencing of the memorial fountain.
Each flower we lay at the fountain represents one of the victims killed in the plane crash. The players were James Michael Adams, Mark Rayburn Andrews, Michael Francis Blake, Dennis Michael Blevins, Willie Bluford Jr., Larry Brown, Thomas Wayne Brown, Roger Keith Childers, Stuart Spence Cottrell, Richard Lee Dardinger, David Grant DeBoard, Kevin Francis Gilmore, David, Gre David Deering Griffith Jr., Arthur W. Harris, Robert Anthony Harris, Bobby Wayne Hill, Joe Lee Hood, James Thomas Howard Jr., Marcelo H. Latterman, Richard Adam Leck, Barry Winston Nash, Patrick J. Norell, James Robert Patterson, Scotty Lee Reese, John Anton Rapassi, Larry Sanders, Charles Allen Saylor, Arthur, Cook, Arthur Kirk Shannon, Lionel Ted Shoebridge, Alan Jean Skeens, Jerry Dotson Stainback, Robert James Van Horn, Roger Arnie Vanover, Freddie Clay Wilson, John Patton Young, and Thomas Jonathan Zaboro. Coaches were Ricky D. Tolley, Herbert B. Brackett, Albert C. Corelli, Jr., Frank Loria, James M. Moss II, staff, Charles E. Kautz, Eugene J. Morehouse, Brian R. O'Connor, Gary Wilson George, Jeffrey P. Nathan, James Joseph Schwerer, Donald Tackett, Jr., Donald Booth, Supporters, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Arnold, Dr. and Mrs. Joseph Chambers, Dr. and Mrs. Ray Hagley, Arthur L. Harris, Mr. and Mrs. E. O. Heath, Mr. and Mrs. James Gerald, Kenneth Jones, Michael Prestera, Dr. and Mrs. Glenn Preston, Dr. and Mrs. H. D. Proctor, Mr. and Mrs. Merle Ralston, Parker Ward, Norman Weichman, Crew, Frank Abbott, Jerry R. Smith, Charlene Pote, Danny Deese, and Patricia Vaught.
This concludes our memorial service for today. I am deeply humbled and honored to have been given the opportunity to be a part of something that means so much to so many people. Please join us at the Alumni Center at Foundation Hall for a reception immediately following the service. Thank you and I hope you have a great day.